It's kind of crazy to think that as recently as 30 years ago, if you wanted to make beer in your home, you'd have to break the law. Thankfully, in 1978, it became legal on the federal level for people to homebrew, but unfortunately, this didn't include everyone as certain states continued to restrict this natural right. But this all ended in 2013 when the last two holdouts, Mississippi and Alabama, passed laws making it okay for people to make beer at home. For the first time since Prohibition, it was legal to homebrew in all 50 of the United States. This was due in large part to the dedication and hard work of the American Homebrewers Association. In addition to continuing the fight for our right to brew, they're committed to growing the hobby by coordinating events such as Big Brew for National Homebrew Day and HomebrewCon. We're proud to say that the Brewlosophy podcast is brought to you by the American Homebrewers Association and encourage all of our listeners to support the organization that has done so much for this hobby by becoming a member today. Welcome back to the Brewlosophy Podcast. I'm your host, Marshall Schott, and I'm here today with co-host and Anchorage, Alaska's own Brewlosophy contributor, Brian Hall, to chat about a relatively new yet immensely popular style of beer. We're going to talk about New England IPAs today. I've been brewing New England IPAs for the last four or five years, um, just as the style was catching on over in New England when I was living in Maine. I've been through 20 or 30 batches probably at this point, changing things along the way. And today we're going to focus on looking at the grains that go into a New England IPA. Yeah, you know, Brian, um, I, I know, humble as you are, I know you're going to deny this uh, or or at least avoid talking about it. But I feel like in the homebrew world, it was a lot of your work and a lot of your experimentation with this style, along with guys like uh, Mike Tonsmeyer and our friend Ed Coffey, who really kind of pushed... Um, I don't know, push New England IPA onto the scene for homebrewers and, and at least helped me uh, kind of get a grasp of what this style is. Yeah, it really helped um, knowing Ed from the Yeast Bay. We talk all the time. And so as as he was starting to to brew his New England IPAs, I started catching on with that. And then being right there in New England, I was kind of at ground zero. So um, I was trying them left and right, had my first case of heady topper and was was hooked right thereafter. Yeah, it's it's awesome stuff, um, and I'm looking forward to talking about uh, what. Well, you know, there's so much stuff that goes into making a New England IPA. Um, it, as similar as it is, it, it well, it's got the the word IPA, or the I guess that's more of an acronym. Yeah, <laughs> IPA. <laughs> it's um, got it's got a lot of a lot of similarities to an IPA, but it also has some really distinct differences. The most obvious one is haze, and so we'll we'll shed a little clarity on that a little bit later. Shed a little clarity, you dork. See what I did there? Yeah, I did. Uh, it's going to be a really good show. You know what else is going to be a really good and fun time? Brian, you, I, I know you know. I know. I'm going. Homebrew Con 2018 in Portland. Portland, Oregon. It's going to be so amazing. We are going to start talking a lot about this on the show. Uh, if you are already convinced that you're not going, I'd like to try to convince you to change your mind. Uh, it's going to be a really incredible time. Brulosophy has partnered with Yakima Valley Hops, Imperial Yeast, and Mecca Grade Estate Malt to bring conference goers a completely unique and super fun experience. Um, we're going to be recording live shows during the conference in the expo. Jersey and Tim are going to be reviewing beers on the spot and giving their really incredible feedback uh, to the folks who, who present beers to them. There's going to be giveaways. We're going to have games, all sorts of rad things going on. Mark your calendars now. Start pl planning and saving. Uh, trust me, you don't want to miss this. It's going to be a lot of fun. We've got some stuff planned for kind of like after party events. We're going to be doing the, the fun Brewlosophy karaoke night again. That's going to uh, be gonna so be great. Yeah, it's going to be so fun. I really can't wait. It's kind of the event. There's a lot of stuff that we do every year for, for brewing and beer. And HomebrewCon is the one that I look forward to the most. You know, it's not cheap. You got to save up. You got to plan for it. Uh, thankfully, it is at the end of June this year, um, which I'm so happy about because it means, you know, most kids are out of school. We get to make, as parents, we get to make our kids, you know, like kindergarten, first grade, second grade graduation, stuff like that. So yeah, it's going to be going to be a great time. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Imperial Yeast, these dudes are doing incredible things, providing homebrewers with pitchable rates of high quality, pure yeast cultures. Every pack of Imperial Yeast contains 200 billion cells, which is like two to three times more than what you're going to get from other yeast labs, meaning you can pitch directly into your wort without making a starter and be assured a healthy fermentation. Uh, we've been using Imperial Yeast almost exclusively at Brewlosophy for nearly a year now, and I haven't had a single issue. Brian, I know you just uh, made a New England IPA using some Imperial Yeast. Yeah, I love their juice strain. It, it 
it's great for brewing a New England IPA. It really brings out some of the fruitier notes and the beers. Um, I, I just also have to say their shipping is fantastic. All the yeast shows up usually the day after it's it's shipped out. It shows up at my door cold, even in our uh, super hot Alaskan summers here. <laughs> yeah, I've always gotten exactly what I'm aiming for uh, when I'm using Imperial yeast. The folks there are really laid back, very cool, super supportive of home brewers. Um, so if you want to check out what Imperial has to offer, you can head over to their website, imperialyeast.com. And I believe their yeast is for sale. You can buy it at More Beer and Great Fermentation. We have links to both of those places uh, on our support page. Um, one more thing I want to let everyone know about. The Brew Club is live. This is something that a lot of people have been asking about. Is Brewlosophy going to come out with a club? I didn't have the time uh, to organize this thing, and so I put the word out there. Uh, if you guys have been listening to the show for very long, you probably heard it. Um, and a group of really dedicated home brewers all got together and have been working their tails off to create this really unique idea for a club. Um, we're still piecing things together. Um, the club is officially registered, which is cool. It means you can start submitting your beers into competitions under the brew club. Um, and we're going to be announcing more about the club in the future as th everything comes together. Uh, right now, the plan is to keep it a free club. Um, and then if we want to do things that require money, then we're going to, we're going to kind of do it on a donation basis. But I think it could be a lot of fun. You know, our main focus is isn't uh, necessarily to be the next big club or anything like that, but to have fun with brewing and beer and maybe enter some competitions with beers brewed using our short and shoddier methods. So that should be pretty cool. Uh, if you live in near any of the following cities and would like to participate in our shenanigans, <laughs> email me, marshall at brewlosophy.com, and I'll put you in touch with the contributor nearest you. We are in, here's the long list, Chicago, Illinois, Denver, Colorado, Pueblo, Colorado, Anchorage, Alaska, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, Corona, California, and Fresno, California. Uh, Malcolm currently lives in Pittsburgh. He will be moving to Atlanta, Georgia uh, in about a month or two, he's saying. Uh, so if you're in Atlanta, you can reach out to us as well, and we'll put you in contact with Malcolm. If you have any questions for our Brew and A episodes, email them to me, marshall at brewlosophy.com, or you can drop them on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, or any of the other online, online forums we frequent. You can also use our new feedback email, feedback at brewlosophy.com for that. Okay. From the last episode uh, that we put out there last week on bagging hops, we, we talked about our experiments bagging dry hops and bagging kettle hops. We got some feedback. Um, one from our friend Scott Janish, a noted NEIPA brewer, where he says uh, regarding bagged dry hops, although sensory results appear to be subtle, bagging dry hops was looked at in a Hopsteiner study for the extraction of linalool, which he says is often used as the hoppy marker when testing hops. Um, that a beer dry hopped with pellets loose versus contained in a finely woven sack measured greater extraction. That's really interesting. Brian, what do you have to say about that? Um, yeah, I mean, that would make sense to me just because you've got so many more pellets floating around in there, you more contact, more more surface area in contact with the wort. Um, you know, if you're, if you're putting them in a, a tightly woven sack, you've got those ones in the center, which, you know, you don't know exactly how much wort's getting into those. It's interesting to me that it was specific to linalool. Um, and, it, and I feel like this sort of, you know, I didn't go and read the study uh, that, that, that Scott's referring to. Um, but, it, it, you know, I think one of, the, one of the ideas that always floated in my mind when it came to um, bagging hops was that there w something would stick to that bag, right? Um, and it looks like you get better extraction, at least on a very scientific, you know, when you're looking really deeply at it, better extraction of linalool uh, when those pellets are added to the wort or to the dry hops or to the beer um, loose as opposed to in a bag. We couldn't, we couldn't pull that out. Uh, you know, our, our, our uh, experiment on the bag dry hops showed not, you know, it wasn't significant. So people couldn't really distinguish a, a, a beer where the dry hops were bagged from one where they weren't. But um, interesting nonetheless. Um, user Pixie Donut on Reddit about the bagged kettle hops experiment. He says, uh, did you stir the kettle after adding hops in either kettle? Did the bagged hops get stirred or jostled around like you would with a tea bag to get the water flowing through it? I know boiling water circulated around naturally, but I stir things around. He says he doesn't bag hops. Uh, and I know if I bagged, I do even more to make the hops well integrated in the wort. Um, that's good. I didn't really discuss that in the article, but yeah, I, in, in the, in the kettle hops experiment, I did stir, you know, every 15, 20 minutes during the boil. That's just kind of something I do as a matter of course. Um, and I used a really big bag, 
a bag that wouldn't really restrict those hops. I think what he's asking about, you know, he he wants to make sure that the hops were in contact with wort, that there were no pieces of those uh, hop pellets that didn't get in contact with the wort, which makes sense. Um, but I did that. And remember right, yeah. that... Any, any, anytime I use a bag, or I have used a bag in the past, especially when I'm doing larger bashes, I, I try to use as big a bag as possible. I'll often reuse my brew bag um, and just put the hops directly into that to make sure that there's plenty of room for them to wiggle and jiggle during that boil. Yeah, exactly. That's that's something Rex from the Brew Bag actually recommends people do. Uh, if if for those who want to bag their hops, which you know, if you're using plate chillers or, or counterflow chillers, is probably a good idea. Um, they were in contact with the wort, though. Um, so and and remember that you know that experiment did come back significant. So people could taste or distinguish uh, the uh, beer where the the kettle hops were bagged uh, from one where they weren't. So that was pretty interesting. Um, final bit of feedback on that one. Uh, it comes from Brewer Two Eleven on Reddit. He says, um, hops don't seem to settle as well as Trube does. Did you measure how much beer was lost due to the hop in the loose hop batch? Do you have an observation of how much is lost in hoppier, especially dry hopped beers using the loose hops approach? Uh, Brian, do you have, I mean, I don't, my my personal experience is that I've never really had a huge issue with beer loss um, due to dry hopping or due to kettle hopping i i you know i tend to yield about five gallons from every batch i make yeah i feel mine are about the same i mean i i guess you could you could try and measure how much how much you've lost due to due to troop or you could you know you could try and see how much is lost in a bag when you remove the bag and see how they compare i don't think it would really be that much i guess it just depends you know if, if you're looking in the kettle it depends how low you let the liquid level go and you know if you're pull if you're using a bag it depends whether you squeeze that bag out when you're done yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't do the, um, I'm not terribly concerned about Trube making it into my fermenter after those experiments, which we'll have a show on in the future. Yeah. I mean, um, yeah, you know, and, and the thing is I don't, it's not like I intentionally rack Trube to my fermenter. Um, I just don't concern myself too much with it. M- what I'm more concerned with, given what we typically do, which is side by side experiments is making sure that a f- relatively equal amount of Trube makes it to the fermenters. Um, but be, you know, like I said, I haven't really had much loss now. In terms of dry hopping, I've definitely, if, when I don't filter my dry hops, uh, which I've been doing lately, uh, I can, I've struggled with, you know, getting a good yield of beer out of my fermenter, but that's, I think that's a different question. So, well, right. thanks to everyone who, um, who gave us their feedback. If you have show feedback, please send it to feedback at brewlosophy.com and we'll be sure to get it, uh, get to it on a future show. All right, um, so I've talked about this before, but I get asked a ton about the music we use in this show. Pretty much all of it has been created by my childhood friend, Mark Gadgetar. Uh, because of this, I set up a page on our website where you can directly download our outro song, easily the most requested uh, or talked about song that we have on the show. It's called Body High, and it's by his group, African Tiger. Um, there's also a bunch of links, links on the page to uh, Mark's other rad music projects. You can head over to brewlosophy.com music. That's it to check out uh, what he's got going on. Don't forget to let him know how much you appreciate his work and for letting us borrow it or have it. (laughs) He's been really cool about that. Uh, He literally sent me just a trove of tunes that, that, you know, he never did anything with. So that's what you're hearing on the show. If you want to throw some support our way, head over to brewlosophy.com forward slash support, where you'll find a list of links you can use when shopping for homebrew ingredients and gear. It has no impact on your shopping experience. And we get a small commission that helps us to keep bringing you these shows. If you want to be rewarded for your support, check out our Patreon, where for as little as a dollar a month, you'll be granted access to never-before-published Brewlosophy recipes, receive invites to monthly video chats, get unique discounts to Yakima Valley Hops, and much more. That's patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Also, please subscribe to the Brewlosophy podcast and leave a review wherever it is you listen to your podcasts. It does a lot for us, and it's really nice to hear what you guys think. Okay, time for the one-minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. And for this one, I had my buddies review a beer that we, you know, for better or for worse, end up consuming quite a bit of. Uh, it's it's a beer that I, you know, admit kind of quietly at times to enjoying um, Miller Lite. It's the, it's the one of the, it's probably the one big beer that I drink the most of, partially because Tim is a big fan of it and he usually has it on tap at his house. What did they think when I served it to them blind? One minute beer review with Jersey and Tim. I feels good. Mouth feels looks good. Nose feels good. Mm. It was good warding. Some some mash. Got, I, I do like it. I think it could have been mashed more. <laughs> yeah. More, more mashing. Yeah, I'm getting that too. Yeah. Uh, strained. I don't feel like it was strained enough. Uh, the 
<laughs> Strain the beer better. I mean, come on. Yeah. Um, what else? Uh, there's remember that bag where everything drains out and everything. Yeah, where were the oh no better? oh the temperature like when you mash in the temperature. To me, what this is is uh, somebody's temperature was damn. Someone's been paying attention. Yeah, it was dude. I watch what he does, bro. God damn. Uh, the temperature was too low. He didn't hit his target temperature. Mm. I, I I like this. I actually kind of like it too. They're all starting to taste the same. Can we just lump everything this into is not beer? The same. This is. I like this. You have no reasons. Why do you like it? Doesn't linger in my mouth afterward. It's supposed to linger in your mouth afterwards. What's the point? No. What's the point if it doesn't linger in your mouth? You just drink more if you want to taste it. Mm. You drink more. You don't need to taste it five hours after. Yeah. Well, I mean, when you're drinking to failure, you don't care if it lingers. But what if you just want to enjoy the taste and you want to be a beer sore? I I, 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 sore. I enjoy this. Okay, well, en enjoy it in, in silence because I'm already sick of what you have to say. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> mm. All right, I agree with you. I got to like this a lot. Yeah. Cheers. What do you think the style of this beer is? Mm. My style. <laughs> it's, it's a newer style, of course, not an old style. Mm. I'm going to say it's a, uh, it's a cranberry lambic with hints of Pineapple. What are you even saying? It's important. Dude, that's what they say. It sounds important. Just say that. No. Okay, I can't do that. <laughs> no big surprise that they liked Miller Lite. Uh, what, a, what an astute review, huh? Uh, Brian, you drink Miller Lite? Yeah, I do occasionally drink the Miller Lite. Um, I've got a case of light beer that I usually keep in the... Uh, Keep in the fridge for just kind of those warm summer Alaska days. Um, you know, also it makes a nice michelada, that sort of thing, which you turn mm. me on to after, uh, after hop harvest. Yeah, micheladas are so good. We do that too, red beers. Um, you know, I know I know. big beer gets a ton of hate, but, uh, you know, for what it's, for what it's, it's worth. It's, it's exceptionally it's drinkable. Beer. Didn't surprise me at all that Jersey and Tim enjoyed this. Right, me either. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm pretty certain that I'll be having a couple uh, sometime today as well. It's just what we do. Tim usually has a keg on tap at his house. So, well, we've got to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be focusing on the grains that go into a New England IPA. Shopping for brewing supplies online can be a real hassle, which is why we recommend Love to Brew. They've got great prices, super fast shipping, and they carry exclusive products like East Coast Yeast, the Brewer's Essentials brand, and their award-winning beer recipe kits. They're also the only place you can pick up your very own Brewlosophy recipe kit. The numbers don't lie. Love to Brew has hundreds of five-star reviews and thousands of brewers are choosing them for their supplies and ingredients each year. Experience the difference at lovetobrew.com. That's love, the number two, brew.com the best beer requires the best hops which yakima valley hops provides fresh from the source to brewers around the world find everything from classics to modern favorites as well as cool experimental varieties and a vast array of ingredients and gear at yakimavalleyhops.com after a long brew day, the last thing I want to do is waste time chilling work, which is why I use cleverly designed immersion chillers from Jaded Brewing. After some bad experiences with counterflow and plate chillers, I began the search for a more efficient chilling solution and discovered Jaded. That was nearly four years ago, and to this day, I continue to rely on the King Cobra and the Hydra to chill my wort in record time without the setup or cleaning hassle of other chillers. If you're looking for a way to optimize your brew day, I can't recommend Jaded Chillers enough. Go see what they have to offer at jadedbrewing.com and let them know Brewlosophy sent you. Founded in 1978 by brewing pioneer Charlie Papazian, the American Home Brewers Association is a division of the Brewers Association focused specifically on protecting and promoting the hobby of home brewing. In addition to their work lobbying for the rights of home brewers across the country, they're also the primary sponsor of Brewlosophy.com. By joining the AHA, not only are you supporting their cause, but you get a ton of benefits as well. Discounts at breweries across the U.S., early access to tickets for events like the Great American Beer Festival, and you get to attend HomebrewCon, the world's biggest gathering of home brewers. Head over to brulosophy.com slash AHA now to sign up to become a member. So Brian, what exactly makes a New England IPA a New England IPA? So in my mind, there's, there's three or four things that 
that really identify the New England IPA as being different than a than a traditional IPA. Um, first off, it's got I feel like it just has a lot more hop flavor and hop aroma in the beer, and it, and it's, it's it's a smoother it's a smoother hop flavor, which kind of ties into the next part, and that's more of a restrained bitterness. So a smoother hop flavor, but also uh, a would you contend juicier hop character? Uh. I, I tried to go my entire homebrew con talk without saying the word juicy once. <laughs> and that's the first thing you bring up. Great. Uh, I, I think I think juicy is a descriptor that people use because yes, yeah, sometimes they do taste like hop juice. They have they have more body like a, like you would drink in an orange juice. Um, and they also have those those tropical fruit flavors and you know that that comes from using so many hops in the in the whirlpool and dry hopping but also just because of the new types of hops that we have you know they're focusing on citrus and tropical fruits so much more than they ever have right right and in addition to that crazy amount of hop character which you know we, we're going to have shows focused specifically on hopping New England IPAs in the future um, but 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 in addition to that they're I, they're kind of known for being super low in bitterness um, and and, and, and you, like you mentioned, kind of having that silky, smooth, full yeah. body. Yeah, so that's the third thing is, is, is just our, is mouthfeel. And that's kind of been my pursuit um, over, the, over the last several years is not even focusing so much on the hops. Because at this point, I kind of know what's going to happen when I throw citra at it. It's going to be delicious. But for me, <laughs> focus, focusing on mouthfeel, those are the kind of things that, that I try to tweak each time. And that's, that's where we'll get at here when we talk about grains in a little bit is, is how to achieve that mouthfeel. I'm sure in a future episode, we'll talk about the water profile as well. I, I think I think there's a part of uh, you know uh, this idea behind mouthfeel that a lot of people uh, presume has to do with the grains that are used, and like you know we're going to get into that in a bit. But there are other components to making an any IPA um, that that are also said to contribute to that, like the you know the 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 heavy dry hop additions, um, the the use of like you said different water chemistry. I think it's really interesting. The style has definitely caused a lot of us to think a little bit differently about how to make a hop. IPA. There's no doubt about that. Right. It's really pushing. It's really pushing a lot. A, a lot of brewers to use different types of grain, to use different types of dry hop regimes. Um, I mean, I think it's a great style for for just the taste, but it's also really pushing people to experiment. Uh, you know, there's there's no set style guidelines as of right now, so the, the, there's nothing that says that you have to use a specific grain or a specific hop or have a certain water profile. You know, that might change, uh, but for now, it's it's really it's really an experimental style, which is super cool. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. So I don't I don't want to get I don't want to be like a history lesson here, but let's let's talk a little bit about you know where did this style come from? How was it developed? Developed. Um, I know you were living in Maine for a while, kind of when it, kind of when it, you know, it burst onto the scene. Um, but what's what's a little bit of the background of this New England IPA? Yeah, when you look at the when you look at the history, most people point to uh, um, to John Kimmick and Greg Noonan working at the Vermont Pub and Tap House. Uh, they, you know, you talk to them, they said they were making hazier style IPAs. Uh, back in the back in the early 90s that wasn't necessarily their intention but they were just trying for hop flavor uh, after that uh, John Kimmick went on to start uh, the alchemist brewery and tap out or Bre alchemist brewery where he pretty much ran a, a straight stream a heady topper and it became very popular people were trading for it crazy it became one of the most one of the most popular beers in New England I I don't know if I go to so far as to say America um, and then, after dude, that I mean, there's, there's no doubt that when that hit the scene, um, it became, I remember everyone talking about Pliny, the elder Russian rivers, Pliny, the elder, and you know, back what eight or eight or nine years ago, it was all the rage and everyone, you know, everyone would go do what they could to get their hands on Pliny, the elder. And then when Hedy Topper came out, I mean, I'm, I'm out here in California and my brother was in New York and he, he took a trip. My brother's another uh, home brewer, beer lover. Um, he's out in New York. He got his hands on some really fresh cans. I believe it was four years ago this month. He sent me a a two week old can of Heady Topper, and it was my first time ever trying it. And I remember thinking, first off, what the hell is this homebrew looking hazy beer doing in my glass? Um, <laughs> but I was I was I was incredibly impressed that it didn't taste like a Hefeweizen at the time, right? I'd never seen a style like this. Um, yeah, I, I feel like you know I, I I've actually heard some argument uh, that that some people don't think the Alchemist is necessarily New England IPA. They call it like Vermont IPA, uh, but that they certainly were kind of the uh, that first domino that started this whole big thing. 
Right. And I think just like when when IPAs kind of became the craze, people were pushing to see how many IBUs they could pack into a beer. I think people are trying to see how much of those three things they can pack into a beer. You know, that, that mouthfeel, that hop forwardness, um, and for some, that haze. So I think I think it be, kind of became the pursuit of the pursuit of the hazy beer, and people were just people are still pushing it to see how hazy, how hoppy, uh, you know, how many adjuncts they can get into these beers to make them as smoothy, milkshakey as possible. Right, um, and you've which, got, and you've got you've got breweries like Trillium, Treehouse, Bissell Brothers, Tired Hands, um, Lawson's uh, Lawson's what Lawson's sip of finest. sunshine? Yeah, yeah, Lawson's sip finest. Of sunshine. That was that was right. kind of my gateway brew was a clone. A clone of Sip of Sunshine, and that's that's where it all started. Um, it was you, yeah, it was it was eye opening to me. Right, right, and you 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 know when at least from what I've read about the uh, like interviews with these brewers, their contention uh, largely, I wouldn't say totally, you know, ubiquitously, but their contention generally is that the haze is an effect of the process, not that it's intentional. Um, right, and. And it seems like that took, it, we're kind of going off track here, but it does seem like that kind of took a turn where people were intentionally trying to impart haze to these beers regardless of process um, by adding yeah. things like flour yeah. and whatnot. It's the, it's the most easily identifiable thing in a beer is how it looks. And so if you're yeah. serving up a beer and somebody hasn't tried it, they can glance real quick and go, ooh, that must be a New England IPA. Right, right, right. Well, know, they'll, they'll order that one up. Yeah, and and regardless of uh, you know whether it's intentional or an effect of uh, the the process, um, there are various aspects of making an any IPA that are said to contribute to this hazy appearance. Um, you've got the the high dry hopping, the keg dry hopping for home brewers. Uh, you've got water chemistry, all of this stuff. And the one we're going to focus on today is malt. Um, so let's let's kind of dig into the different types of malts that are typically used in this style um, and how those are said to impact the the uh, the appearance and the flavor and whatnot uh, of these beers. Right. So the malt in a New England IP. IPA recipe is seen as kind of a supporting role. Um, you know, it's one of those things where if you don't have it, it's going to be pretty obvious. And if you have too much, it's going to be obvious. But if it's just right, you're you're not even really going to notice it. So some combination of two-row, Pilsner, Maris Otter, um, and then some kind of adjunct. Usually there's some sort of flaked oats, flake wheat, uh, malted wheat, those sorts of things. But, uh, you know, there's definitely some play. I've heard of people using, using uh, millet. Um, and other other grains, oat milk, um, other things as adjuncts to try and get more more mouthfeel and body. But really, as far as base grains go, uh, it just kind of depends how I, I I think how hoppy you're going to have the beer, um, and and just establishing a kind of balance. In the right, beer. right. So I you know when I when I first heard about. Uh, well, you know, when Ed really, when Ed and you started writing about New England IPA uh, homebrew recipes and whatnot, one of the sort of consistent themes that I saw in those recipe, uh, those recipes was the use of flake oats in particular. Um, and the, you know, when I think about flake oats, I think about beers like oatmeal stout, or you know, maybe you toss in five to ten percent flake oats into a brown ale to give that silky smooth mouthfeel. Um, not, it definitely wasn't anything I'd ever considered using in an IPA though now that I think about it I know that Lagunitas little something something is like a is like a almost 100% oat based beer uh, or maybe that's wheat based I think it's 100% wheat based yeah I um, think there's some oats in there too I think they use uh, oat malt but I could be oat wrong malt is, okay yeah so so but there are you know some people have, I'm sure have experimented with it I know there's golden naked oats which is like a crystallized oat uh, oat malt. Um, so people have been using this stuff in IPA, but it, it was obviously different uh, when I started seeing the recipes uh, that, that you, Ed, Mike, Scott Janish and stuff were throwing out there. And uh, it seemed like flaked oats was the one that was constantly going, people were going back to that one. But, um, you know, the idea is that it's a high protein, unmalted, but flaked grain that's going to contribute in addition to that, uh, those long chain um, protein or those proteins that are going to improve that mouthfeel and make it kind of more silky and smooth and, and, and you know, a bigger bodied beer, uh, it just happens to also contribute ostensibly this uh, haziness. Right. Yeah. When you have, when you have a lot of, uh, when you have a lot of proteins and you have a lot of, I mean, you get, you get a lot of partic a lot more particulate matter coming out of a, a mash with oats in it. Um, and so you've got, you've got proteins, you've got proteins interacting with, with polyphenols. 
Um, and, and those things can uh, impart a permanent haze into your beer. And there's, and there's other, there's other adjuncts that people are using a lot as well. I know you've had a lot of experience using different types of wheat from flaked wheat, malted wheat, um, and even, uh, and, and you did an experiment before you were with Brewlosophy using, uh, what was it? I used, I used steel cut oats. Steel cut oats. So, yeah. Right. So, I mean, we'll get to it. We'll get to it in a little bit, but I, I went ahead and tried to, uh, replicate the, the oats versus no oats experiment ended up using steel cut oats, which I didn't, I, I didn't think twice about it and just dumped them in realizing I probably should have done a cereal mash on those. So, right. Um, totally what different, make, totally different game, but uh, exactly. And what makes flaked adjuncts flaked grains work is that they're flaked they've been steamed um right. and so they can they can still but yeah if you're going to use something like steel cut oats you gotta you gotta cereal mash those bad boys um so in addition to those there's some really interesting things i mentioned flour earlier some really interesting things that some professional and home brewers have done to um i guess try to I, I, I don't want to say the word improve, but to do something unique for their New England IPA. Uh, one of those is the use of oat milk in place of the flaked oats. Yeah, I think they're, I think the goal is to just try and get that mouthfeel to be as smooth as possible. Uh, you know, that, that is kind of one of the things of the New England IPA is having that silky smooth mouthfeel. And so when you, when you think of drinking something smooth, oftentimes we think of milks or milkshakes. And so that, those are two of the things that people have tried putting into these beers. They've tried oat milk and they've tried making milkshake style beers. Uh, so using, using oat milk is, is, is where you put oat, oats, it's where you put oat milk into the, the flame out of your, uh, after you're done boiling. Um, I suppose you could do it in the mash, but it made sense um, when I tried it to use it uh, during the whirlpool or during during flame out. Uh, the idea that you're getting a stronger oat flavor, if that's something you're looking for, your beer, and maybe that it might add some creamy, creamier body. Yeah, and and oat milk also has sugar. It's a sweet. It's a sweet liquid, um, and so you have to account for the fact that there's going to be some uh, fermentability as well, right? Right. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, if you're, if you're adding it into your, your whirlpool or your flame out, you know, it'll go in and it'll get fermented out. I've also tried adding it, uh, just post fermentation right off the tap, you know, a little, a little couple teaspoons kind of, kind of is a little fun to play with. Uh, but you know, it really imparts a pretty strong oat flavor. Um, yeah. If you're, yeah, you're weird, that you're, you're weird, Brian. That's <laughs> yeah, weird. Yeah. I would never do that. Yeah. I've never used oat milk. I probably never will. Um, but that's just, that's par- partially because I'm lazy and don't want to go out and buy oat milk, but uh, I've tried it. Other- I, pro- I probably won't go back to it. Uh, I, you know, we'll talk about Jake's experiment a little bit later, but it, it was, it was fun, but it's, it was kind of a phase. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not seeing too many oat milk, New England IPAs these days. It seemed like it, it was like a four month thing and now it's done. Um, some other interesting things people use in their New England IPAs to try to bump them up is apple puree. I heard, I think it was, who was it? Tired hands who threw yeah, some tired hands has done apple puree. They've also, you know, they've, they've make these milkshake beers, which are almost more like cocktails than beers at this point. And they're adding, you know, up to 40, 50% oats. They're adding lactose. They're adding few fruit, fruit purees to try and get some fruit flavors. And they've got a whole fruited line that people chase after, you know, something I could try six or eight ounces of, but nothing I'm going to make five gallons of. Right. Right. Well, and I, and I did hear that, you know, their use of, uh, f- the, f- the few per- fruit puree, uh, in those new England IPAs was sort of a tongue in cheek type of thing. Kind of a like, Oh, this is how we're going to get the haziness in there because of the pectin and all that. Uh, so I, you know, I'm not so sure that's not, that that's going to be, you know, a trend in, in, in new England IPA making. No, I don't think so. I think it's, st- I think it did start, it kind of started out as a joke because everybody was calling these hazier beers, the milkshake beers. So they were thinking, <laughs> why don't, why don't we make a milkshake out of it? And right. you know, it's good for them. It seems to have taken off pretty well. Yeah. So, so really briefly, what is it, what is it about, uh, the, you know, these grains and whatnot that, that, that are said to kind of impart the haziness to these beers? So when we add these grains and we're adding, so, so some of our, our haze, our haze often can come between reactions with polyphenols and proteins. And, uh, when we make these, when we make these new England IPAs, we're bumping both of those up. So we're adding more polyphenols because we have more hot matter in the beer. And then we're also adding more proteins from these adjunct grains that we're, that we're putting into our beers. So we, 
we've spent a lot of time kind of digging into uh, uh, or trying to figure out what the what is really causing this haze. Um, and and we, you know, our findings so far have been pretty inconclusive. Um, we've had beers made with flaked oats look the same as those made without. We, you know, I've seen a lot. Um, in fact, you you used a certain malt one time, like crystal clear or something like that malt that, that created a New England IPA that was as clear as any other normal IPA that I've ever seen. Yeah, I used a crisp clear choice, and I believe that is has less polyphenols in the malt. So I think that was that was helping out. Although you know, when we when we have such a large whirlpool and dry hop addition, we are adding in a lot more a lot more polyphenols. So um, right. you know, I don't I don't know whether it was the malt or whether whether I was doing something different in the brewing at the time. It was kind of before I was really documenting and and paying as close attention to all of my recipes as I did later on. Right, right. Well, for anyone who's interested in learning more about the haze that goes to New England IPA, uh, I can't recommend scottjanish.com, uh, his, his Scott Janish's blog. Uh, uh, no, he's, a, he's an article over there called Researching New England IPA. We're not going to get into it here. Uh, just know that it's a really great, uh, really great kind of, uh, you know, review of all of the potential haze contributors to New England IPA. Um, you know, I've, I've, I live out here on the West Coast, and while you guys were getting all of the fresh, you know, New England IPA out east, uh, you know, I, I was still drinking Union Jack and Pliny the Elder and, and all of the clear IPAs we get out here. It wasn't until probably two, three years ago um, that I actually, we started seeing, you know, New England IPAs popping up at, you know, breweries and whatnot. And now you can't go to a brewery without, without you know, seeing one or four freaking New England hazy IPAs on tap. <laughs> oh yeah, I mean they're they are literally so hot right now, and you know you've got these uh, you've got these new hop varieties coming out that are just loop, lupulin instead of having all the vegetal stuff. So that's another another way for brewers to get more hop flavor and into into the beers that they're making. And so that's kind of in the last year or so as YCH released the the lupulin powder, uh, they you know they've started pushing or they started allowing people to push uh the beer the beer flavor and aroma even further which has kind of inspired a whole new a new and a whole new set of experimentation right 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 and as and as trivially controversial as this style has been uh we've certainly taken interest in it and we've performed numerous experiments uh many of which have focused on the impact of different grains which is exactly what we're going to get into as soon as we're back from this break stick around When dumping wort-soaked grain in leftover low-gravity wort while cleaning up after a brew day, do you ever wonder what your true efficiency would be if that wort made its way to the kettle instead? Using the brew bag, a fabric filter for all mash tuns and brewing methods, allows you to capture every last drop of wort. Not only does this increase kettle efficiency, it lowers your grain bill, which saves you money. Throwing wort in the trash is like dumping a 12-pack down the drain and just doesn't make sense. Use the brew bag and leave no wort behind. I've been using these filters for a long time and recommend them to everyone. I never have to worry about a stuck sparge and cleanup is fast and easy. Go grab yourself a brew bag fabric filter at brewinabag.com and be sure to use code TBP17 at checkout to get a discount on your order. Compact and simple to use with a small footprint for brewing indoors, the Grainfather makes it easy for you to brew professional quality beers at home. The Grainfather is an all-in-one brewing system that lets you brew all-grain beer in a single, compact stainless steel unit. It uses an electric heating element and pump to maintain a constant temperature and to circulate the wort during the mashing and cooling stages. It also comes with a counterflow chiller to reduce chilling times and produce high-quality wort. And now, with the addition of their conical fermenter, the Grainfather takes things one step further by offering homebrewers state-of-the-art temperature-controlled fermentation just like commercial breweries use. And with the Grainfather Recipe Creator and Connect app, you can easily design a recipe, sync your brewing system with your phone, and then just sit back and relax as the app takes over and assures that you maintain your scheduled mash temps and boil schedule. Head to grainfather.com to purchase your all-in-one brewing system today and to sign up for their free recipe creator tool. Once more, head on over to grainfather.com. That's grainfather.com and get started today.
One of the first things that struck me as interesting about the style, about the New England IPA style, was this relatively heavy use of flaked oats uh, as a part of the grist. Um, most of the most of the recipes I was seeing in the beginning, Brian, um, your aloe hops recipe, I, I'm not sure if you used oats or wheat in that one, but I but I I saw how simple that grain bill was. You know, um, the a lot of American IPA recipes that you'll see will have a small amount of crystal malt. I know that's become kind of fallen out of favor with home brewers and with professional brewers these days. Um, maybe a little bit of Vienna or some Munich malt. Most of the most of the any IPA recipes I was seeing were like two grains, maybe three, uh, but but generally sticking to a pale malt base with a chunk of one of these flaked adjuncts. And uh, you know, I I became interested in the impact that this, these flaked oats were actually having on any IPA, which inspired my first experiment uh, on this style. And it was actually the first time I'd ever made a New England style IPA. So I was sort of excited to see what I would think afterwards. Uh, what I did is I brewed two batches of New England style IPA. They were, they were one of them had 82% Maris Otter, or uh, sorry, one of them was 100% Maris Otter compared to the other batch, which was 82% Maris Otter and 18% flake dotes. Uh, the flake dotes I used, everyone asks about this, was the, I think they're called Rob's, like mil, I got them off of Amazon anyways. Um, and <laughs> yeah, actually it was a, it was a recommendation by Ed Coffey. I, I didn't know what to pick up. So they're a little bit cheaper if you get them on Amazon as opposed to your homebrew shop. Heads up. Excellent. So. Good to know. Yeah, excellent. <laughs> you can also use like Quaker Oats, whatnot. But. Yeah, that's what I've done is just Quaker Oats. I have my Costco. Yeah. <laughs> Costco. You should, that's the next name of your any IPA is just going to be Costco. Uh, trademark, right? Yeah, pretty um, much. <laughs> so uh, I, I brewed these two beers. Um, interestingly, the Flake Dotes batch had came in with a slightly lower OG of 1056 compared to the 100% MO batch which was at 10.58. Yeah, not big enough for me to care too much about, but definitely something to observe. Yeah, to be expected. Um, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, right, because because you're putting in less of a um, uh, of a converted or a or a hot malt um, and replacing it with flaked oats. That makes right. sense. The finishing gravities on the batches were exactly the same. Um, so I think it produced like something like a, a you know 0.3 or to 0.5 percent difference in ABV. So not a big deal there. Um, it, I was really, really curious by how these beers would end up looking. Um, to me, this was almost as interesting as the triangle test results. Uh, I, I sort of expected, you know, at this point in time, I'd never made an any IPA. I had this expectation that the oats were the main contributor to the haziness. I right. did everything else that I did everything else that um, th that you're supposed to do with any IPA. I did a biotransformation dry hop. I, I fermented it with uh, the juice strain or whatever it was, thirteen eighteen. Yeah, um, London three. Yeah, right. Exactly. I did all the other things, but I was convinced at this point that flaked oats were the culprit for the haze. Um, so, so if if in my head, if there were no flaked oats, then this other beer was going to be a little bit clearer. But you know, right off the bat, both beers had this pretty surprising amount of haze. Um, they were slightly different in color. Uh, the flaked oats batch had more of that expected kind of juicy looking orange pale color to it. Whereas the 100% Maris Otter beer uh, was a little bit, had kind of a tinge, a darker tinge to it. Yeah, I would say that the uh, the oats batch looked, looked, looked a little bit lighter, a little more enticing to me. It just kind of had that that glow about it. Um, and I, and you know, I, I, I referenced Scott, Scott Janish again and going, uh, looking over at his website and just, just checking out that, uh, that researching the New England IPA haze. And he, he speaks to a couple different studies where when, when there were higher, higher adjunct grains in the beers that, that the beers showed up as being less hazy because you have essentially, essentially you have more stuff, more, more, par, mar, more, more larger particulates. And so they, they precipitate and they fall out of solution easier. Huh? That, it yeah. almost feels counterintuitive. Uh, it does, based on what we've been kind of trained to believe about, you know, grains like wheat and oats and whatnot. So, uh, pretty interesting stuff over there on Scott's website. Um, I, I guess the real question though was, did tasters taste a difference? Was there an actual perceptible difference between these beers? Um, so I, I served them. I served nineteen triangle tests uh, to different participants, um, which at that. Uh, number of participants, you would need 11 to accurately identify the unique sample in the triangle to imply significance. And surprisingly, 
only six got it right, which is just under one third, which you'd expect by random chance alone. Um, obviously not a significant finding. Uh, you know, it'd be easy, I think, at this point to say, oh, obviously the flaked oats don't matter. But it, it is, you know, those that, that, that adjunct grain is a normal part of the New England IPA process um, and ingredient list. So I, I'm not going to jump to that. What I can tell you is that in my own attempts, I was completely unable to distinguish these beers. They tasted exactly the same. However, when looking at them, I could tell them apart every single time. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I was, when, when you, these results came out, I remember... I remember exactly where I was. I was sitting on my computer in Maine and I sent Ed Coffey a note and I was like, dude, have you read this? And he's like, he's like, he's like, no, he's like, no, it can't be. And I was, I was, I was shocked. Yeah. And that's, that's when I, I, you know, I, I tried, I tried doing it myself at home and, and I, I, you know, I ended up using steel cut oats, but, um, you know, I couldn't tell the difference in those either. Oh really? So so yeah. I remember when you put that out there. The um, you, you and I were chatting as you were designing this steel cut oats experiment, and uh, you know you you um, you inadvertently failed to do your you know cereal match. Yeah yeah yeah. But whatever. But yeah. even with that, that that's the curious thing though is like even with that, you still couldn't tell those beers apart. Which you know on I, I remember reading those and then kind of viewing the your results in light of this experiment uh, and the results that we got and kind of thinking you know. New England IPA really is a showcase for hop character. And, you know, we get all the time, if ever we do an experiment where we're doing a, a pale ale or an IPA or some other relatively highly hopped uh, beer, the first comment, if it comes back not significant, is, well, the hops got in the way of everything else. Well, I mean, if that's the case, New England IPA is a hop forward beer. You know, how, do, how else do you test it out? That, you know, I guess that's kind of my line of thought. Right. I mean, we're not testing whether you can establish a difference with oats in any beer. We're, we're looking at a New England IPA because right. that is where people are saying, you know, you need to have X number of adjunct grains in it. Now, I, I don't know. I, I would be really curious to try this out at, at you know, 40 percent, 40 percent oats and see what the difference is there. Definitely. Um, you know, whether, whether that would whether that would do anything. But I was I mean, they say that 18, I, I believe it's 18 percent. Uh, oats is kind of the threshold of what people can taste. So I mean, when this came back, I was I was shocked. Yeah, yeah. Well, we were we were interested, uh, despite the the not non significant results from that one. Uh, you you actually got really interested in what kind of a difference we might perceive in a New England IPA made with either flaked oats or wheat malt. And you know, those are those are two different things. Flaked oats is not a malted grain, and wheat malt is. This was not a flaked oats versus flaked malt, a uh, wheat malt or flaked wheat experiment. This was wheat malt versus flaked oats. What was your thinking behind that one? Well, I I had in all of my Alohops beers, I'd always done 20 to 25% oats. I'd never done wheat um, in the first 3 years that I've been brewing these. I just I you know, I I did oats right off the bat. It was delicious and I thought I'm just going to stick with that and I was going to work on my my mouthfeel and my hops um, hops profile. And I, I hadn't really given weed a thought just because I, you know, weed, weed always comes back to me as, as being a little bit, a little bit drier, not quite as smooth. I get sort of um, like a tart thing when I use yeah, heavy weed. Yeah, tart, tartness. That's, yeah. that's, that's a better way to describe it than dry. Uh, but, but I was working with a, a local brewery here, here at, just out, outside of Anchorage. And uh, we were trying to help, we were trying to develop a, a New England IPA recipe for them. It's Girdwood Brewing down in Girdwood great guys. And they were talking about putting in copious amounts of, of flaked wheat into their recipe and so, or sorry, wheat malt. And so I, I said, all right, that sounds good. Um, I've always done oats and I went back and I decided to play with some wheat. So I put some wheat in my beer and I thought, oh, okay, this is pretty good. And then I thought, huh, am I really picking up on something? Or am I thinking in my head, Hey, I know how a wheat beer tastes. I'm getting some wheat out of this. So I decided <laughs> that would never to, happen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it never happens. Yeah. And I remember chatting with the rest of the crew and saying, and saying how I was going to be able to distinguish the difference in these beers easily. Um, so, cause I brewed, I brewed mine with 27% uh, flaked oats in one batch, 27% flaked wheat in the other batch. The other no, wheat malt, wheat malt. We keep Sorry, saying wheat flaked malt. wheat. It's Sorry. so easy to make that mistake, but it was... Well, I've got, I've got it written down my notes. Sorry, as, uh, as flaked wheat. But yes, wheat malt. <laughs> and um, so I put that in. The rest was, was uh, Great Western two row. And I, I noticed that after, after the batch was done, there was, there was a slight uh, difference in OG similar to similar to yours. It was a uh, three points difference. The flake wheat, or sorry, the, uh, the oats was slightly lower at, at 1052. The wheat malt was 1055. 
Um, and they, they also, mine, mine did finish slightly differently. The wheat, the, sorry, I keep getting these mixed up. The <laughs> oats finished at 10, 10, 12 and the wheat finished at 10, 10. So I guess it's um, not surprising, kind of, kind of like with the other one. It's not terribly not surprising, surprising yeah. to me that the flaked oats had a, a lower OG. Again, the wheat malt is a malted grain, um, so yes. it's gonna ha- it's gonna have better extraction and whatnot. So that wasn't too surprising. Yeah, it's got those enzymes in there, so that's gonna that's gonna help it out. Exactly. Uh, yeah, but so he, the shocker out of twenty one participants, I needed I I wouldn't say I needed twelve needed to get it right for, to show significant to show that it was significant. Uh, however, seven got it right. So it wasn't significant. Again, which, exactly one third, right? Seven exactly. is exactly if my math if my maths are okay, seven is exactly one third of twenty one, which you would expect if people were randomly guessing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's I words fail me at this point, and, and the kicker is because I was sitting in this exact seat with my test, and I was chatting with the rest of the crew about how frustrated I was because you know we, we, we test ourselves on these as, as blindly as we can. We know the variable, but we test ourselves. And so I sat here, test after test after test, <laughs> failing. I mean, I was, I was less than a third. You're such a was, failure, Brian. I, that's what my third grade teacher said. No, <laughs> but I was sitting here testing myself and each time I'd pull it up and I'd be like, ah, oh, this is the one. And I'd pick up the beer and it's all right. That's, that's maybe got a little more tartness to it. You know, it's got a little more of that, little, you know, dryness, however you want to describe it. Whereas this one seems creamy and I'd pull up the one that's all creamy. I look at the bottom. There's a big W on the bottom. It'd be like, ah, <laughs> crap. Oh God, man. It happens yeah. every time. So, I mean, knowing the variable, it was, it truly was baffling to me to not be able to tell an almost, almost a third, almost a third of the, well, I should say a little over a quarter, um, of the grist being, being oats versus wheat and having a different, and you know, that, that could be just from the, the, uh, the hops, you know, overshadowing everything as everybody says, but you know, when you're doing, when you're talking a quarter of the grist, that's, that's a fair chunk of it. And to have it be, have it to be indistinguishable to me was was shocking. Yeah, dude. And, it, and I don't, I, you know, this goes down kind of a, a little bit of a rabbit hole and I'm going to stop myself short, but it, this sort of speaks to this uh, concept of when we're tasting beers that, that we know what the difference is side by side and we're telling our, you know, how, how often, and I'm not dissing anyone out there. I'm just as guilty as anyone else of this, but how often are you like, oh yeah, man, you know, those, those wheats really imparted this tart character to it. To, I really preferred flaked oats more when really you, you, it's possible that your conception of what it is that you're tasting, uh, what you are perceiving is completely influenced by what you know is different between those beers, which, you know, it's why I chose psychology as a profession that that stuff interests the hell out of me. That's why I'm not in psychology, actually. But <laughs> you just want to no. own. You just want to be the guy who's like, "No, I'm right. Just trust me, I'm right." I, no, I, I just want. I just want to hear. Yeah, I just. I just want to hear the results. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's 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 baffling to be able to do, and it's it, you know, it's more than side by side. Because if I give you two beers side by side, you're gonna you're gonna expect a difference between the two. So you're gonna be looking for. You're gonna you're gonna know. Your mind's gonna be searching for. You're searching right, and I, inventing is what I like. You know, and, I mean, inventing. Now, I, I will say that when I, you know, I, I would, I'm only one person and I knew everything that was going on before, before these beers were carbonated and cold, um, you know, I was, I was tasting them side by side. I, I even did a couple triangle tests on myself and, you know, I got, I got, I think I got enough, I think I got four out of six right or something like that before it was cold and carbonated. But, you know, there's a lot of things going on at that phase in the game that could have, could have tossed that it's it's also you know i think it's it's easier to pick up on things on a beer when it's when it's warm and flat yeah um, it can that, be that you that you don't get it, yeah it can be right um so one of the so. there was also just to just to put it out there there was a slight difference in appearance i think the wheat malt beer um kind of again similar to the no oats beer in the last experiment was yeah maybe a tinge darker than the flaked oats yep. beer yeah the the oats beer was was ever so slightly lighter yeah well, uh, you know, Jake Houlihan, our, one of our contributors, uh, who's been, you know, he's been interested in New England IPA for a while as well. He got interested. You, you actually, I believe, had a chat with him about using oat milk in beer. Yeah, we were chatting about it at uh, Homebrew Con because one of the when I was giving the the talk on New England IPAs, one of the beers I brought um, did have a small amount of of oat milk into it. I think I put a quart into the beer at Flame Out in addition to the uh, regular 20% of oats. And so uh, I think he was, he, he, he was really curious about that and kind of 
you know, talked to me and said, all right, so, you know, what, what, am, what do you think would work as far as an experiment goes? And, you know, we kind of riffed off the same thing that, that you had done with the 18% flake dotes. We, we thought, okay, well, let's, let's shoot for about 20%. So he used, he used, uh, 21% flaked oats, uh, 79% Maris Otter. And then in the other batch, he used about a gallon of oat milk in place of the flake dotes. Super weird. I, I've never. This is again. I, I it's, remember. It's strange stuff. It's strange. Yeah, I've never even tasted oat milk. Uh, but I do. I do remember this conversation starting at Homebrew Con uh, in Minneapolis this year, and uh, was definitely interested to see what kind of an impact the oat milk would have as compared to flaked oats. Um, what he ended up finding, he he, in, in the one gallon. Just just to get this out there, the one gallon was determined based on all sorts of stuff, uh, uh, math stuff that Jake did to determine the amount of sugar that's in oat milk and how the OG how he could align the OG from both batches to be about the same. And he did a really good job. The flaked oats batch came in at 1058 and the oat milk batch came in at 1060. Uh, to me, I mean, that's for, for, for a first attempt, that's really close. So kudos to Jake for doing that. Um, the beers were treated exactly the same otherwise and uh, ultimately ended up fermenting down to the same finishing gravity of 1012 FG. Yeah, I you know, and, and as far as the way that they looked, um, they kind of looked the way I expected them to look originally. Um, and I was kind of surprised because, uh, they ended up, they ended up looking quite different at the end. At the beginning, the, the flaked oats was, was hazy. The oat milk was also quite hazy and had a, a milky appearance. I remember him sending me a couple of pictures early on, but then as, uh, as time went on, you know, two or three weeks later, uh, the oat milk one ended up clearing up quite a bit, which, which which kind of seemed surprise, surprising to me. Yeah, it was to me as well. I, 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 full, I actually sort of expected the opposite to happen. Having never seen or tasted an oat milk beer, at least that I know of, um, I, I expected the oat milk version to kind of maintain a haze longer. I've, I let a batch of New England IPA, accidentally actually, I, I, I unconnected it from my keyser and it just sat in, my, um, it sat in my keyser for about a month before I realized it was still there. When I plugged it back in, back into the, uh, to the faucet, it was clear. It had cleared up quite a bit. So uh, my expectation was that the clearer beer would end up being the one with the flaked oats and not the oat milk, but it was the opposite. Right. I mean, I think, you know, I, and I think that, that idea of, of our, of, I guess you call it our bias or our, our previous impressions influencing the way we think about things. I mean, just the term milk conjures up a, an illusion of something being opaque and, and white. Yeah. And so when I, when I envisioned oat milk going into beer, I envisioned that that kind of dispersing throughout the beer and just staying there. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. Well, he served uh, the triangle test to 28 participants, which would require 15 people to get it right uh, in order to imply significance. And in the end, uh, 18 people were able to identify the odd beer out in the triangle test, which means that it was reliably distinguishable. We had a significant result on this one, um, which, you know, we all we can do from that point, we, there's no way for us to say exactly what it was that made these beers distinguishable besides the way they looked. But we do serve these in opaque colored glasses. You cannot see the beers. Uh, and even, you know, the color of the glass kind of changes the color of the foam. So it's, it's really difficult to base it off of, uh, base your selection off of appearance. Um, but, at, but 18 out of 28 participants is, is pretty strikingly significant, uh, made me think that perhaps there is something in the haze. I started to kind of drift away from this idea that the haze was, was the defining characteristic of a New England IPA, that perhaps it was something else, but it made me, you know, kind of push me back into this idea that maybe there's something in the haze that really does impart a characteristic difference. Yeah. I mean, I, th I think it's, I think it's part of that. I also think I also think that oat milk has an odier flavor to me um, than like when I'm eating a bowl of oatmeal. Almost, it's just, it's almost like it's a concentrated oat flavor. And I remember in reading in the article that Jake was talking and his impressions that he got that oat flavor as well. Um, you know, I mean, oat milk is essentially just a bunch of shredded oats that soak and then are strained out. So, I think there's a lot of a lot of flavor flavor coming out of those as opposed to um, you know, flaked oats being added in the mash. So, uh, so you're, 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 what you're saying is that it's not necessarily the, it, it was the oat flavor in the clearer oat milk beer that probably was the, the, the tip, uh, for people to choose that. It's just a, it's just a guess only because of my, my dealings with oat milk have always been, wow, this, this tastes, this has a nice mouthfeel to it, but it also tastes oaty to me. 
That's interesting. Uh, a part of me just wants yeah. to try the oat milk on its own now, <laughs> but right. um, it's you know the, it, one one thing to consider when it comes to oat milk also is is you know for for cheap asses like me, um, oat mm-hmm. milk is really expensive compared to flaked oats. Like you, I mean, the, the, you know the the amount of oat milk you get for the for the same price that you would spend on flaked oats is significantly less. So. Um, you know, if it doesn't make, well, it does make a difference. And I guess it depends on what it is you're looking for, but uh, I'll probably, if ever I make, you know, New England IPA again, I'll probably stick with flaked oats. Right. And, you know, thinking about what you were just saying about the, the haze, the haze there as well as, you know, I, th- I think it could be, I think it could be a little bit of both because when Jake was talking about drinking these beers, he was noticing the oat flavor. And I'm not sure whether that comes from him. I don't know at what point he drank them. So earlier on, when you've got that oat milk in solution a little bit more before it's dropped out, it could be that that he's tasting more of the oat milk flavor but when he talks about them you know that that oat milk kind of dropping out you're you're losing the haze but it also seems like you might be losing some of that oat flavor huh. um, i don't i don't know exactly when he when he served them to participants or when he tried them himself but it, you know it, there might be some correlation there i'm talking about oat flavor you're talking about haze right you know what maybe that maybe the two are directly related there yeah yeah i'm pretty sure with most of our new england ipa uh, experiments. The our, you know our goal is to serve them as fresh as possible. We try to serve all the beers that we do for the experiments when uh, we think that they're at their prime. You know, and so um, right. I know he I know he saved some of that oat milk beer. Uh, he had, you know he had some left in his keg, and and that's where we got that that uh, clarity difference. But interesting results uh, that made me think. Before we move on to talking about how this has impacted our brewing, I really I think we need to address this idea. This I guess kind of observed thing that's been happening with New England IPAs, um, and that's this kind of darkening of the beer over time, which has been blamed on primarily oxidation. And it would seem, I don't want to spend too much time on this, but because uh, there there's some there's some ideas out there that this oxidation is in some way exacerbated or uh, hastened by the inclusion of flaked oats. And the idea being that flaked oats have in it, again, I'm not going to get too much into this, but a metal, um, that manganese, that um, interacts with oxygen to kind of, I, for lack of a better term, but in ways kind of like, you know, quote unquote rust. Um, but it, it, that one theory is that it's, it's that the oxidation of the manganese in flake dotes that kind of quickly reduces the shelf life of New England IPA. This is something that Scott and I have talked, Scott Janish and I have talked about quite a bit. I know he's doing a lot of research on that stuff now for a book that he's writing. I'm sure it's going to be an incredible book. I can't wait to get my hands on it. But um, have you, is this something you've experienced um, when using flake dotes in your New England IPA? I personally, the only times I've ever experienced it is when I leave the beer out. Um, I notice that it changes color very rapidly, much much quicker than any of the other beers that I have that I have brewed. Uh, I've also noticed that it's happening in growlers that are a third of the way full. Um, you know, I, heaven forbid somebody somebody doesn't finish a uh, growler of New England IPA, um, but I have had it happen where we're at a party and it just doesn't get done. And the next morning I come out and the the color has has noticeably changed by by that next day. Yeah. Um, you know, I've also, I also played around at the end of the, uh, the oats versus wheat just to, just to play around with that. I, I put, um, a be- I put both beers into clear plastic, class- plastic bottles and, uh, screw the, screw the lids on tight and let them both sit there. So I had one with oats, one with wheat just to see if, and then, and then one that was open to the environment. And just to notice if there was any discoloration, you can, if you go over it on the, on the brewlosophy.com, you can, you can see the, the different pictures I took over the course of five or six days and sealed up. They don't, they don't change, but you know, sitting out, there's a, there's an immediate change in color within the first day or two. It's amazing. And yeah, th- this is, I, so there, my, my little anecdote for this, uh, and where I experienced it first, uh, was I took these, uh, the new England IPA, that first flaked oats versus no oats experiment. I, I, I use, um, Nalgene bottles, which by the way, great way to transport beer. And especially if you get those little, uh, they're like an add on cap with a small spout out on the top totally no leaks holds the holds the carbonation in really well so um yeah go get nalgene they are not a sponsor of this podcast (laughs) but (laughs) but, um but anyways i i had some of those they're not i I can't imagine that they're totally 
um, airtight, but when I, you know, I fill them directly off of my faucet. So there's a bunch of oxygen in there. I had filled up three of these Nalgene bottles, took them over to house of Pendragon brewing company where I collect data occasionally, um, collected all the data there and had a little bit left and just kind of left them out uh, in my garage in a cooler, but in the Nalgene bottles. And I came back the next day to clean them up. And I kid you not the, the, every single, the, 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 I believe it was the beer with the flake dotes in it. Yeah. Um, was almost purple. I mean, it was so dark, just like what, what I see in the picture here on uh, your article on brewlosophy.com. It just took on this really purpley, almost brownish tinge, which is so incredibly fascinating to me. And by the way, completely ruins the flavor of the beer, in my opinion. And I, yeah, I was going to say what that tastes like. It, well, I mean, did you taste the beers that you left out? Uh, not the one I left out. That one went down the drain because that just, <laughs> that did not, by day seven, that thing just smelled not pleasant. Well, um, yeah. I did try, I did try both the bottles, um, and neither were particularly delicious, Yeah, but neither were, were going to make me throw up. To me, to me, the flavor is like a hard candy. It's the, it's like this sickly sweet, um, it uh, kind of lemony almost like I think of lemon drops um, and, it, and it just clashes with all of the other good stuff about New England IPA. Oddly enough now, uh, this is I was I talked about this online in different forums and on Facebook. Uh, there are people out there who have experienced this with other non flaked oats or non adjunct IPAs that they've made, um, which has led some, I don't think they've experienced it so extreme, uh, you know, but, but, um, there's been some speculation that perhaps a lot of these newer hops that we're using, these really high oil, high alpha hops like Citra and Mosaic, stuff like that, that there's something about those. And I, I can't speak to the science behind it, but that also contributes to this quicker kind of, um, uh, you know, darkening or, or oxidation, uh, definitely a reduced shelf life. So definitely more explore exploration to do there yeah definitely sounds like something to put on the list yeah god it's interesting okay so anyways that was oxidation we went way way more into that than i expected to uh pay attention scott janish is going to be releasing his book soon you're going to want to get that one if you like ipa especially new england style ipa he's doing all kinds of really neat research for that one um brian what have you changed have you changed your process at all how has this influenced your thinking these experiments that we've done on the grains that go into any ipa it's been surprising i mean i'll if being 100% honest, I'm still putting oats into my beer um, just because it's what I've always done. But it 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 does make me think twice about about the impact that it's having on the beer. I've been re I've been doing a little a little research um, over at Scott's website and some other papers I found about you know some of the some of the interactions between the proteins in those in those um, in those adjuncts and and some of the polyphenols in the beer and how those can help to uh, provide a, a smoother mouthfeel. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that, 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 that's what I'm most interested in. Yeah. You, you know, one of the, one of the, um, comments, I, I wish I could remember who said this uh, to me, but, um, and I, I don't think it's a single person who believes this, but there's this idea that, that it, it is a, you know, this kind of cumulative effect where all of these things that you do to make an any IPA are what ultimately produce the best type of any IPA. So it's not just flake dotes. Um, the idea being that, you know, we selected flake dotes and everything else was done any IPA style. So that one little thing, you know, maybe the impact is small enough to where you don't taste the difference, but if you were to remove, say, the biotransformation dry hop and the flake dotes, then it's going to be even more noticeable. And then if you removed, you know, the juice yeast and some other aspect of it, it's even more noticeable. Um, and I think that's, I think that's a valid argument. And uh, so in many ways, my thinking about New England IPA and the way that these, these experiments have kind of impacted uh, my approach when it comes to this beer, which I don't make very much of, um, is that, you know, <laughs> there's this, um, you, you, I'm still basically going to do everything that you're supposed to do to make it if I'm making it to enjoy it and not experiment with it. Uh, you know, in my thinking, I'm going to throw 20 to 30% flake dotes at it. Uh, I, I read somewhere, I thought it was on Janish's blog, um, that, that, you know, there's been some experimentation with upwards of 30% flake dotes that were really successful. So, um, you know, and I'm going to do all the other stuff as well. I do think it's interesting though, that when, when looking at, uh, New England IPA alone, you know, not compared to other styles that, you know, if you run out of flake dotes and you just want to make a New England IPA with straight pale malt or Maris Otter, you can probably pull it off as long as you do everything right. else right as well. So, 
Yeah, just go for it. And I, I, you know, we touched on it earlier when we were talking about grain. We, we, the first thing that we said was this is, this is one of the places where you do have some leeway. Yeah. So I think that, you know, it's, it's be like if you, if you left out a, a dash of a, a, a certain spice in a sauce or something like that, you might, you might not notice it, but that might, that's not necessarily the meat of what it is that you're, you're putting into your product. Yeah. So I, I think that, I think that it's, it's, that as far as a New England IPA goes, I, I do think there's a lot of wiggle room in term, when it comes to grain, a lot more wiggle room than I thought there used to be because, you know, I used to think that it, that you had to have oats in for that silky smooth mouthfeel. But now, you know, now I'm thinking maybe maybe it's more so in the water. And we've done so many experiments on water and shown that water is such a huge contributor to how, how a beer can how a beer can taste and how, you know, the mouthfeel it can have. So, yeah. you know, I, I'm starting to think that, that, oh, that, that while the, while the grist is important and it is important to have it be a, a supporting role in the beer, it's definitely not the dominant one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, I feel like, I feel like, um, we've covered a lot about the grain aspect of New England IPA. We've done a lot of other experiments on this style and we have many more planned, uh, like, like, like you said, Brian, from, from water chemistry, we've done biotransformation experiments. All of that stuff's going to be talked about in the future. If you want to read more about these variables or any other of you know the sciencey stuff we're doing, uh, you can head over to brewlosophy.com. We've got the Hop Chronicles, Short and Shoddy series, um, and of course, an entire list of experiments. The Brewlosophy podcast is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors, as well as all of our rad listeners. We seriously could not do this without you. Cheers to everyone who has subscribed and left a review of our show. It makes a huge difference. If you haven't yet, please consider doing so. Head over to brewlosophy.com slash support to view a list of ways you can easily help us to continue producing this podcast. If you want a reward for your support, visit patreon.com slash brewlosophy. Thanks again for listening. We'll be back next week with another episode of the Brewlosophy podcast. Until then, think beer. Start off the morning with some hot tea, lemon and honey, cause it suits my bro. Put some herb in the bowl, yeah, it's homegrown. Ain't gotta go through the middle man no more.